trivia? Are you good at trivia? Do you have that worthless pieces of knowledge floating around your head? <laughs> That's what I call it. I like trivia. I'm a trivia person. But I want to I just ask you a couple questions. So when you know the answer, raise your hand. Okay? Don't shout it out so everybody can know it. Just raise your hand when you know it. Okay. This ship left England April 10th, 2000, I think, 1912, headed for the United States. She was thought to be unsinkable. She hit an iceberg on April 11th, uh, April 14th, about 11.40 p.m. Keep your hands up if you know. I want to know when everybody knows. <laughs> she sank about 2 a.m. on April 15th. She had over 2,000 passengers. They made a movie about it <laughs> in the late 1990s. <laughs> with Lee. How, who, 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 what am I talking about? Titanic. Titanic. The Titanic. Now, all those things I told you were very true. You know, when she set sail, she was thought to be unsinkable, although that was never actually said by the builders. It was actually said that she was practically unsinkable. But somehow it got to me that she was unsinkable. But alas, we found out that she wasn't, was she? <laughs> no. But we all have this fascination. You know, that happened, what? That's over 100 years ago that that happened. I think it's appropriate that it happened on April 15th, because <laughs> we all kind of feel sunk on April 15th. <laughs> 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 it comes time to file those taxes. <laughs> but it has captured our imagination a little bit, I guess. And I guess they romanticized it some a few years back when they made the movie, uh, The Titanic. And, but, you know, it showed a whole lot of different types of people were on the Titanic, didn't it? You know, there were the rich people who got to eat up top and had the nice uh, quarters. And then there were the people who didn't have money, Right? The immigrants that were just wanted a new life and were happy to be headed towards the United States, but they were beloved, right? So there's a, a wide variety of people, kind of like society and day, right? We have people with money, we have people without money, we have people in between. You know, we have people wishing they had money. I'm in that group. <laughs> but but the uh, but but there's a whole lot of variety there, wasn't it? And when the Titanic was struck, they, and they knew that the ship was going down, they handled it kind of differently, didn't they? How many of you actually watched the movie? Or, I think it was a pretty watched movie, so most people saw it. Three or four times. <laughs> Three or four times. <laughs> but you remember the scene that the band was playing on the deck while the ship was going down? So they handled it one way. They were pretty calm. They were kind of, what's well, going to happen? And, you know, we might as well make the best of it. And they were uh, playing their instruments, and it was kind of... Uh, calming effect to the other passengers. Some people were some people were bribing people trying to get on the boats, right? So one guy was uh, dressed up like a lady. I think that's pretty famous now. Dressed up like a lady because they were taking what lady women and children first. Women, women and children went first on things. They were taking women and children first. So he dressed up like a woman because he wanted to get on wanted to be on one of those life saving boats. So everybody kind of handles it differently, did they? And you know, there was 20 boats, 20 lifeboats on that ship that held 2,000 or 20, 2,200 people. I think it was a little over 2,200 people. He said, that's not nearly enough, but you know, that's more than what that was required. They only were required to have 16 for a boat that size, but they had 20. And the ship goes down and the boats go out to sea or out in the water. And 700 people were saved by those lifeboats. And over 1,500 people died in those cold waters. But the funny thing was they didn't drown. They 
froze. That's right. No shark attacks. Nothing. They just simply froze to death because the water was too cold. They couldn't survive. But you know, the real tragedy, and, 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 and the sequel of Titanic is a tragedy, but when I look back at that story, the real tragedy is, is that those boats that left, a lot of them were less than half full. Those boats were lowered into the water. The first one only had 12 people in it. The first one was launched. So there were 20 boats out there, a lot of them half full. Well, I think the tragedy is that only one went back. They could hear the screams of the people in the water. They knew there was a need there. But only one boat went back, and I think it saved six people. Six of them. <laughs> they can only find six people still alive. Even then, you freeze pretty quickly in the water, in case you don't, you don't know that. But they can only find, they saved an additional six people. But I wonder how many people could have been saved if they had all gone back. If they had all turned their boats around and headed into those frigid waters and looked for people who had survived. I wonder why they didn't. <coughs> you know, in today's scripture, we, we hear of The scripture is, is actually a, a parable that is the second in the series. And I understand Billy uh, did a good job last week. I read. A, I actually had a chance to read the sermon. And this sermon was written before uh, he went to Chicago. But it's kind of funny how God works in these things. But talked about time's ticking, right? Right? Tick tock. Time's ticking. But there's just a, we don't know how much time there is before God comes back, right? And this is kind of piggybacks on that in that uh, there's work to be done while the master's away. Uh, this follows the, I think, the parable of the ten virgins. But, the, but this, this, this particular parable talks about there's work to be done while the master's away. The time is indeed taken. And what that tells me, it's not about Let's see how much money we can go out there and make. I don't think that has anything to do with this. But it tells me is there's, we're supposed to be at the master's work, which is what? Why did Christ come? <coughs> he came to save us, right? He came to save lost souls. He came to reconcile us to our creator, to God. And if we're to be about the master's work, then we too, are to be about saving souls, about spreading the good news of the gospel. That's our job. And while we might be shocked that those people on the Titanic had turned their boats away from those who were in need and didn't go back, I have to wonder if sometimes we don't do the same thing. We know we know that there are lost souls out there. We know that there are people who, if they don't hear the good news of the gospel, will certainly spend their eternity separated from their creator to say it nicely. We know that there are people who need to be reached. We know that there are people who have never encountered the love of Jesus Christ, either in word or in action. But yet we row away. We keep rowing away. I wonder if sometimes we think, well, you know, I got mine. I'm saved. I'm safe. It's all good. They'll figure it out. No need for me to get into their business. I don't want to be too nosy. I don't want to be too pushy. But aren't we leaving them out in the cold water when we do that? We know the result's going to be death. We know that. It's not even like we think they have a life jacket on. We know that they're going to die if we don't go back. And yet I have to question myself included. Do I, do I devote enough time to the advance of the kingdom of God? 
Do I do enough work? Because there's work to be done. And I know what you're saying is that I don't have that kind of ability, preacher. I don't have that. You know, I told you before I read this, let's talk about bags of, of gold. And your, your version probably says talents, right? Well, you know what one talent is? One talent is the equivalent to 20 years work. So it wasn't a small amount of money. When somebody says, well, he gave him one talent, that's a lot of money. One talent in those days was a lot of money. And I submit to you, you have more than enough talent to do the job that's been set before you. You say, I oh, preach, I can't sing, and I can't, I, I can't preach, I can't even pray in public. I just get the shakes. I just, you just, I don't know. I'm just not confident. I don't have the confidence I need to do it. I can't sew, I can't cook. I can't even write a get well card without breaking out hives. I mean, I can't do anything. And I say, you're wrong. You have more than enough gifts. I told you one talent was 20 years worth of work. But let me ask you a question. When you were baptized, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, did you not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Of course you did. That Holy Spirit came to dwell within you. And he dwell, has dwelled in you every day since then. And he dwells in you today. Did you not have your own personal story? How God changed your life? Did you know that's the, one of the greatest gifts that you have is your personal story of how God changed you? How God work within you, how that Holy Spirit has changed the way you perceive the world, the way you go about doing business, the way you go around treating people. Did you know that's the one thing that can't be debated? Because it's your story. It's personal. And when you tell it, nobody's going to argue it. You see, God gave you more than enough to be a witness for him. He gave you that Holy Spirit that will empower you to go out and speak to people in ways that you didn't even know you possessed inside you until you opened your mouth and things start coming out and you're like, where did that come from? How did I not come up with the words to say? I didn't know I had that inside me. Well, you do. You know, you don't have to think you have the words. Ask the Holy Spirit inside you to give you the words. When you don't think you have the strength, ask that Holy Spirit to strengthen you. To give you the courage to do the things that you need to do. You know, I don't think those people went back because of indifference. I hope not. And I hope we don't not spread the gospel because we're indifferent people. I think sometimes fear takes over. You know, I think fear of getting up and, and telling your story or fear of sharing your story with somebody will keep you from that. Fear of singing because you don't think you have a pretty voice. I sing even though I know it's not pleasant for y'all. But I do it anyway because I'm singing to worship God. Right? And I'm hoping that y'all will forgive me. <laughs> we have talents with inside us, but we have to have the courage to use it. Do you understand what I'm saying? At least nod your head. So I know you're awake and not just bother you. We've got, to, we've got to draw on that strength that's inside us. You know, we're in a broken country right now. There are a lot of broken people out there who've never heard the good news of the gospel. And they need to hear it. And they're not all going to come through these doors. You know that, right? This is, this is a destination church. Unless somebody invites you and tells you where it's at, or picks you up and brings you here, you're probably not going to know about that better Christian church. We, I think we can agree on that. You're not on the main highway. You know, we're not on TV every Sunday. We're not at desk. You know, we're somebody, we're a church that somebody has to invite you to. Which means that only a, only a select number of people are going to come into this building. But you encounter countless people every day of your life. don't you? And you know, when you encounter those people, God makes you responsible for 
said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean you're not responsible for them? You know how you act towards that person? You're responsible. How you treat that person, you're responsible. Does your actions, do your words reflect the love of Jesus Christ? Is that how you treat people? I mean, not just everybody. Not just a few people. I mean, everybody you meet, right? The guy who cuts you off, right? You let him know he's number one in your life. I know some of you. <laughs> but I mean, but is that how we're called to do? Is that what we're called to do? No, 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 no. When somebody does you wrong, what are we supposed to do? Forgive. Supposed to forgive. We're not supposed to carry a grudge. That's not what we're called to do. We're a loving people. We're an accepting people. We're a people that embraces the fringes. Maybe those who just don't fit in anywhere else. That are different. Do we care about that homeless guy or we just step over him and wish he wasn't there? <coughs> so I don't know what to do. Well, have you tried to find out? That's a pretty big question. There's a difference between not knowing what to do and not trying to find out what to do. You see, the, the, if we look through this book, there's a lot of words here, right? They tell stories, and they tell us a story of God's love for us. Through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, one basic thing, God loves his people and wants to be reconciled to them. He's your creator. <laughs> That's the story. It's a story of love. Now let me ask you this. Are these words, words that you read? Are they words that you can recite? You know, I know some people can recite the Bible really well. As a matter of fact, they can tell you where every one of your sins is located in the Bible. Every one of them, they can tell you where to go, what page to go to, what, what verse. Of course, they always have a hard time finding their sins in the Bible. But they can tell you what yours are, right? But you see, the stories in here are just, uh, don't get me wrong, because I don't you think, well, you know, the preacher's saying I shouldn't be in the Bible. No, 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 no. You should be in the Word. I want you in the Word. I want you reading the Word. I want you memorizing the Word. I want you playing it in your heart. But more than that, God wants you to live the Word. You understand that there's a difference between knowing the Word and knowing the author. He wants you to live this out daily. He wants you to live it out when you raise your children. When you get up in the morning, you greet your spouse. That's a good place to start. You know, that's, you're starting your day off and you're starting their day off. Right? We want to do that in a loving way. When we go out in the grocery store, when we encounter somebody who might be a little slow, be patient. Maybe God put them there because he knows you're not. Maybe you need to work on your but He does that to me all the time. I don't know about y'all. He puts those people in my life all the time to work on my patience. I'm, I'm going to get good at it sooner or later. I, don't know when. I, don't, I can't give you a date, but I'm working on it. And I hope you are too. But people are our response. Excuse me. People are our responsibility. Those people in the water are our responsibility. We don't need to be spending our energy rowing away because God tells us we're responsible for him. He's given us a job. He's gone. But if you read this book, you know he's coming back. That's right. That each of us will have a judgment day. And he's going to ask you what you did to advance his kingdom. And what will your answer be? I hid it in the ground. I hid 
my faith because I didn't want anybody to see it. I was afraid somebody would think I was a fanatic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't want to be one. You don't have to be a fanatic. You know, there's worse things than being a religious fanatic. I can tell you right now. But you don't have to be a fanatic. Don't let people scare you with their labels. Don't let people scare you. Because God is on your side. And that spirit that dwells within you goes with you everywhere you go. When I step foot in prison, it's with me there in prison. I'm not scared. I don't go to prison scared. What's the worst they can do to me? Well, yeah, why well, I can get killed on the street. I can die anywhere. I can have a heart attack walking out of here stepping on a piece of ice. I mean, you can die anytime. I'm not afraid to die. Hate pain. Not good at pain. But I don't, I'm not afraid to die. You know, you need to wear your, your, your faith as a badge. Be proud of it. Be proud of who you are and to who you belong. There's work to be done. Lots of work to be done. We need to turn our boats around. If they're heading in the wrong direction, well, I'd say we need to turn. If yours heading in the right direction, <laughs> just keep going. But if your boat, if your boat is heading away from people, well, you need to turn the boat around, and you need to head back into those cold waters. And we need to reach out and be the hope of those people who have no hope. We need to tell them the good news of the gospel. We need to let them know how they can spend life eternal with a creator who loves them. Who wants a relationship with them. And sometimes it's going to be in words. And sometimes it's just going to start off with the actions and how we treat them. Either way, we need to be headed in the right direction. I hope you'll join me as we head into the chilly waters this year, 2016. And all God's people said, Amen. You know, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior,